Hi, it's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. This episode is a discussion of a novel by Ayn Rand called We the Living. So thank you so much for listening and I hope you enjoy the discussion. Okay, so We the Living is the one which is basically set in Soviet um, Russia and it's actually her... um, It's pretty much like an autobiography of her time. Really? Yeah, yeah. It's, It's an interesting one. If you If you get a chance... It's uh, it's a very interesting book. It's actually written. In, it's the first novel that she wrote, and it's about um, a a woman who returned to St. Petersburg shortly after the uh, Civil War and Revolution, and is trying to study right at the point where the communists have just taken over. And of course, that's exactly what Ayn Rand did, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. And it is. I mean, it is brutally uh, sort of depressing. <laughs> it's, um, it's. I remember Steph saying once that in Ayn Rand's books, um, freedom lost in the first one, it was a tie in the second one, and won in the third one, right? The first one is We the Living, where freedom loses. The second one is The Fountainhead, where it's sort of a tie. And the third yeah. one is um, Atlas Shrugged, where they win. <laughs> <laughs> right, but, right. But um, now this one is, it's pretty brutal. It's very well done, though. It's, it, it's, um... That's surprising. What was the, what were the characterizations like? Um, well, to be honest, that, the, the characterizations, um, I found it a little difficult to keep track, because I'm listening to it on audio. So mm. I found it a little bit difficult to keep track of who's who, because they've all got these deep Russian names. And it's like oh. Melissa Ovinovsky, uh, and I'm thinking, hang on a minute, which one's that? Is that an aunt or <laughs> who is that again? <laughs> right. But, but I right. they all refer to each other with their first and middle, and <laughs> yeah. But I mean, they are a little bit, they're a little bit, um, you know, um, cardboard in some ways. In the way that Iron Rand's ones are very extreme, you know. But I have to say, probably less so than later. I mean, the interesting thing is that one of the main characters is actually a communist, and he's a man of integrity who sort of ideologically was a communist in the beginning and then becomes gradually disillusioned, right? Oh. Um, But he's actually one of the ones who has quite a lot of integrity in in the story. Um, And interestingly enough, the, the kind of Kira, the main heroine, is going out with a an aristocrat who who's just a total bastard basically i can't really understand why he's a hero at all because he just treats her like shit um but i think the idea is he's not a communist so you know oh right that makes him that makes him um cool virtuous yeah yeah why do you ask about the characterization well because i was just uh i was wondering how they and you did a pretty good job of uh describing how they compare to uh at the shrug and fountainhead and mm. um when you said that it was uh surprisingly well done i was thinking hmm, yeah you know. yeah i mean they're not they put it this way there is what's interesting is that these characters actually do go through a transformation right Whereas in her her other characters, like, they're just born, you know, superstars, and then the world changes and they just sort of fight their way through, do you know what I mean? Right. Whereas these characters go through a transformation, and the transformation they go through is from virtue to corruption, and almost all of them are destroyed. I mean, they are, actually are pretty much all destroyed by the system. And so it's, it shows how, basically, the the... The rise of communism and it is like a gang takeover i mean it's very well done the way she describes like the communists taking over the university and then gradually the secret police starts getting his fingers into to everything and so forth and to in order to survive everybody starts making compromises including the lead character right including kira and starts lying to their loved ones and doing you know all of this stuff right to get by and so, interestingly enough, they, they are, although, you know, this was her time when she was supposedly into Nietzschean superheroes, the characters do actually go, undergo a transition to, basically, to, 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 to get broken by the system, which is wow. kind of interesting to watch, you know. 
none of the characters is capable of rising above it. Not really. I mean, they like in a sense, the rising above it of of Kira's boyfriend is that he just becomes totally self destructive, and he like just takes massive risks with black market trading and stuff, which is in a way just sort of you know completely signing his own death warrant, right? And right. she keeps saying to him, look, let's just save the money and let's find a way out of here. And he's like, oh, what's the fucking point in trying anymore? He's just sort of like, he's just kind of, he's so disgusted with himself as well. He's just sort of given up. And she is at like having an affair with a party member, basically for, to protect herself. And so she's like lying to her boyfriend and she's, you know, so she's completely morally compromised herself to survive. And I bet, you know, in some ways, it was probably Ayn Rand thinking this is what I would end up doing if I'd stayed there, you know? Yeah, yeah. Did she write that book in the States? Or yeah, was yeah. Still there? Yeah, she wrote it in the States. <clears throat> she left when she was, what, 14, 15? No, she left when she was in her... She finished university, but I think she went quite early, so she left when she was, like, 21 or 22. Oh, 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 okay. So she basically studied um, at university... In the years from, I think, like, 1918 until 1921, or something like that, right? So she, she was surprisingly good English for... Uh... I know. I know. It's amazing. I, I thought she left earlier in life than that. No. But I read the autobiography, and the interesting thing is that apparently, I mean, her family really uh, got hammered because they were... Um, as the communists would call petty bourgeois, right? They were sort of middle class um, right. and owned a shop or something. And apparently as a 14-year-old girl, she was in the shop when the communists stormed it and expropriated it. She was in the shop, right? So she actually saw the jackboots come through the door and, uh, you know, basically, like, take over everything. I mean, oh, you, can imagine, you can imagine how traumatic that must have been. Oh, Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Wow. Oh. Oh, she actually wrote an autobiography? Well, no. She said about this book, this is the closest thing to an autobiography that I'll ever do. Oh. And in the book, um, Ayn Rand and the World She Made, I can't remember who the author is, but it's a biography of her. She basically makes the case that lo- loads of the stuff in We the Living is pretty much Ayn Rand's sort of experiences. Um and a lot of it is, you know, obviously the, the Kira hero heroine is, is, um, is, you know, incredibly beautiful. And all of these things that Ayn Rand's uh, characters always, the shorthand for virtue and beauty that she always uses, right? Right, right. But still, I think a lot of the, um, I think it is, it, it feels very well observed. And I, I'm sure that that's because she saw this stuff happening. Like she shows how people got, got arrested and what happened to them when they got sent off to Siberia and when everyone knew that was basically it, they were just dead. And she talks about the black marketeers, like, being in with the communist party, you know, having basically protectors within the party who sort of um, helped them to rip off money from... Sorry, to rip off supplies from these state corporations and then sell them on the black market and then pocket the you know, rewards and stuff. So it's, like, it's totally showing how how, like, everyone gets completely sort of morally corrupted by the system. So it's, um, it's kind of hardcore, this book. It, um, and interestingly enough, you know, nobody had written a book from inside Soviet Russia when this came out. I mean, I think this is one of the only novels that came out of that period of time, and I never heard about it. Well, uh, what about... Uh... Oh, what was his name... Oh, Yevgeny Zamayev or something. We. Yeah. Yeah. I can't think of his name, but his yeah. last name. But yeah. He had one that, well, he didn't actually publish from within. He, he, he got the novel leaked to a French publisher, but... Solzhenitsyn. Uh, oh, well, there's also Solzhenitsyn, too, That's right? That's true, of course. But I think he was like, 19, the, he was like 1950s, wasn't he? Yeah, he was 50s. He wasn't the, the 20s. Yeah, like, this is, like, literally right after... I mean, the book is really about the sort of encroachment of the communist state. And what's interesting about it is also that when she describes it, she describes how 
in the first few years, they're all like, nah, these guys will be out in a year. This is just ridiculous. You know, nobody's going to nobody's gonna stand for this crap. Do you know what I mean? They, there's this right. Whole... right, this is too crazy to last. Exactly, exactly. And I think it's quite well observed, you know, that, that, that idea that I'm sure that there were people thinking this, and this is never going to last. Well, the crazier it is, the more it's likely to last. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. But it's well worth having a look at if you get a chance. It's, um, it's, a, it's an interesting novel. I listened to it in audio. It's another, obviously, because it's an Iron Rand novel, it's another monster. So it's like 40 hours or something ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, what would you say, like, if you were to compare the Kira character to... The, the the heroines in the other two novels. What would you say is the biggest difference between them? Well, she's not as barking mad as the one in the Fountainhead. She really? Just, well, the one in the Fountainhead's just just totally. Yeah, nuts, yeah. Nuts, isn't she? Domin- Dominique is out of her mind. Dominique's like absolutely barking, and there aren't. I mean, I haven't quite finished it yet, but there aren't there aren't any like dodgy rape scenes in this one um yet um although (laughs) (laughs) although she does still have the kind of you know he pressed himself against her and and pulled her hair until it hurt and you're thinking like bloody hell that doesn't sound very nice you know (laughs) and um so there's all that sort of like slightly on the verge of s&m sex in it but there isn't any literally like you know fountainhead style rape things going on so it's not as um so the, the lead the lead the heroine isn't as as barking as that and i think actually what's interesting about her is that she i mean she's not she's she's um she basically spends the whole novel like totally lying to two guys she's two timing these two guys right one oh, who she, one who she ostensibly loves and the other is this party member who she's basically shagging in order to keep herself protected and to get money off him. Um, and so the interesting thing is that there's not a lot of, you know, oh, shit, I'm lying about this. There's not a lot of uh, guilt going on at all in that character. So maybe in that sense, she's a bit like the, the other Iron Man characters who are all like mildly sociopathic in their complete lack of empathy or guilt. <laughs> but, um, but. I, I would say the difference here is that this is like totally desperate circumstances, and in a way, you can kind of understand when people are being shipped off to concentrate to um, uh, you know work camps in Siberia and stuff. You can kind of understand how they're all all the main characters are just getting totally corrupted because they're all basically fucking terrified. You know, I mean, the whole situation is is like, and right. oh, and here's another thing that's really nobody well- wants to get disappeared. Exactly, and they do another thing, which is she observes this really well, and you can just so imagine it, right? So first of all, obviously the economy starts to grind to a halt, and there's no work, and everything's nationalised, and you can't get food unless you've got a ration card, and you can't get a ration card unless you've got employment, and you can't get employment unless you've proven to be, you know, a responsible citizen. And that means, basically, you, you've got to be working for, um, for the party, or working in a party-approved job. And in order to keep that job, you have to go to all these social events, right? And she describes how it's like, oh, citizen, you need to come and present on industrialization tonight at the Marxist Reading Club or something. And they're all like, oh, fucking hell, I've got to read up about industrialization. <laughs> they're, all, they're all going along and doing these sort of, like, presentations. And I can just imagine this kind of social obligation to go and spout out all of this Marxist nonsense in order to prove that you're loyal, you know? Yeah, exactly. It's not because they're not doing it out of the social obligation itself. They're terrified that if they don't do it, that somebody's going to come and haul them away as an enemy of the state, right? Yeah. And one of the characters says, you know, they make us do all of this stuff because they want to keep us from having any time to bloody think. So it's like not only have we got to do all these menial jobs... But we've actually got to go along to all these stupid social events because then you don't, you don't even have time. And she describes how they give them exams, right? In, like, one of the... Kira works as a... Um, she's, um, like, a tour guide around a museum or something. And all the tour guides have to be able to answer questions about what's in the news. And they're like, you know, 
how many oil how many oil wells did we did we um did the soviet state build in baku last week or something and they're kind of like i don't know well you should know about these things this is all part of your uh Consci- consciousness of uh, of our growing state. Right? Don't you don't you care about the 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 revolution and yeah yeah yeah. So it's it's sort of um, it, it goes on on like that. And um, but Kira, like so, as I was saying like, about a character, you can you can sort of understand the circumstances. Apparently, interestingly enough, Iron Rand went back and edited this because apparently in the first edition. There was some far more explicitly Nietzschean um, morality in there. Um, really? Yeah. So there's a quote that apparently, like one of the, the communist guys <laughs> says to Kira, "I oh I understand you are uh, you admire our ideals, but you um, dislike our methods." And apparently, in the first edition, Kira says, "Oh, on the contrary, I admire your methods and I hate your ideals." Right. And the idea being that um, she admires their bloody mindedness of just, you know, um, being totally in pursuit of their of their own ideology to the point of killing people and so forth. And uh, Ayn Rand takes it out. And so in the, in this edition, she just says, um, no, I, I don't admire your ideals. <laughs> <laughs> And the well, idea- actually, that's interesting because that squares with something else that I read. Um, Ayn Rand a- actually used to keep um, journals about the novels that she was writing. Oh, really? And, yeah, yeah. And um, in, uh, it wasn't for this novel. It was for a novel she never wrote. Um, she writes uh, glowingly about a murderer somewhere in the Midwest here in oh, the 20s. Yeah, I think I, re- I seem to remember. But the things she's saying about him are actually sort of similar to what you're saying about, like, how I admire your methods, but I um, despise your ideals, right? Mm. And she speaks about this guy in terms of, like, well... His ideals might be fucked up, but you have to admire the fact that he's uh, going all the way, a hundred percent committed to them. Right, right. That he's acting on them. Yes, I seem to remember hearing about this because, and he was like some kind of awful, like um, child rapist and killer type guy, wasn't he? I mean, he was like a. Oh yeah, he was a flat out psychopath. I mean, this I've I've read this about Rand, like that she actually. You know, what the hell was going on that she was getting, you know, interested in, in this psychopath? And I seem to remember that the whole idea for her was that the entire society was against this guy and therefore she was interested in taking a, a, an opposing view or something like that. Isn't that right? Well... Because on the, on the face of it, you've got to say, like, Iron Man, what were you fucking thinking, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah it's On what planet is this, uh, you know, is this a cool guy? Well, she was wrestling with the concept, right, of acting on your values, right? Right. And that's what this guy was doing, at least in one sense, is acting on um, a certain kind of value in his own mind. Right. Well, I guess that's true, maybe at the abstract level, but I guess psychologically there was probably something else going on for her during this part of her life. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and I'm guessing plus that plus the fact that there's that, but there there isn't a single hierarchy of virtue that you can define or describe that makes murder a value. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm I'm guessing that. I mean, she must have had a lot of unprocessed trauma from having grown up during those times because they were just super traumatic times in Russia. And, I mean, you know, she, as I say, she saw her whole family get, you know, like, uh, well, expropriated and no doubt there was all sorts of weird stuff going on that we probably will never know about. Um, Yeah. I mean, who knows? It's quite possible that that um, when they expropriated, they they might have raped her. You know, it's quite possible because when they jackboots go in and they start, you know, and take over, it's not like they're going to be 
particularly uh, respectful towards Jewish um, small business owners in you know in 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 terms of the communist ideology well, i suppose they weren't necessarily anti-semitic but at least small business owners they they're not going to be um you know they're not going to be respectful those are the class enemy right yeah so who knows what she went through and also we, I, who knows what she went through in her own family that she wasn't processing but um there's yeah and, and just in the way that you describe the love of interests that Kira was engaged with yeah. in this book. Um, you can you can catch sense of um, you know uh, her relationship with Aunt Rand's relationship with her father possibly or with uh, uncles or yeah uh, you know the male the male uh, figureheads in her in her in her childhood family. Yeah. So I think there are two things going on with this book and her early work. One is that thing that you were talking about at a, at a sort of abstract level. She was definitely thinking about Nietzsche and morality and um, living your ideals and so forth. And on one level, like, you know, she was doing some really good groundwork for what she then later was more consistent, you know, not fully consistent, but more consistent about in terms of going against the ideals of a society when they're crap ideals, you know. But yeah. on, an, on an unconscious level, I think there was also something to do with a fascination with um, the use of, of um, force, and particularly, you know, in the later novels, sexual force. Um, yeah. That I don't know what that was about, but I'm guessing it was some kind of unprocessed trauma um, from, from her childhood. So. Oh, yeah. So I think this one is, in some ways, though, like, uh, I think it's a more straightforward novel than, than the other, others because it really is quite rooted in, I think, you know, she was, she was trying to describe what the hell was going on over in Russia where everyone was talking about, you know, the dawn of a wonderful new age and, uh, isn't it amazing, you know, Russian revolution and all of this. And she, and she was like, I've just come from there. Do you know what these guys are doing out there? And I think yeah, that's, it's, yeah. it's pretty bizarre how disconnected the the um, the rhetoric was from the reality. Yeah. Because even here in this, even here in the states today, where things are pretty pr- pretty propagandized, it's nowhere near that level. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. 